This is the third and final part to our discussion of the financial environment. In it, I'll discuss the primary roles of financial intermediaries, the pieces of legislation that govern how intermediaries operate in the United States, and I'll provide a short discussion of financial intermediaries and markets outside of the United States. Let's get started. When we talk about a financial intermediary, we require a lot of latitude because there's a broad definition of what constitutes a financial intermediary. In general, financial intermediaries are institutions that facilitate the transfer of funds from those who have funds to those that need funds using financial products. Historically, most investors think of financial intermediaries as banks and occasionally insurance firms, but there's a lot of other institutions that would fall into this category. Essentially, any institution that acts as a middleman between two parties, one lending capital and the other borrowing capital, is considered a financial intermediary. Because banks receive deposits and lend those funds to individuals and businesses, they're considered financial intermediaries. Pension funds that receive funds from employers and invest that money in the market are also considered financial intermediaries because they provide capital to the firms whose bonds and stock they are buying. Financial intermediaries play a number of roles in the broader economy. First, they reduce the borrowing costs for individuals and firms. This is because there are lower search costs. Everyone knows that you can open a bank account and deposit money, and firm management know that they can borrow from a bank. The benefit here is that firms don't have to spend the time going out finding every single individual who might lend them money. They can simply go to a bank where that capital has already been pooled and borrow from the bank. Financial intermediaries also diversify their clients' risk. This is most evident with mutual funds. When individuals purchase shares of mutual funds, the fund receives that cash and it invests that cash in stocks and bonds. The portfolio the fund creates is usually very diversified. This means that a decline in the price of one stock or one bond in the portfolio won't collapse the value of the total portfolio. Finally, financial intermediaries provide financial flexibility to investors by offering a variety of financial products. For example, at a commercial bank, an individual investor can choose to place their money in a savings or checking account. They can also purchase certificates of deposit, get a mortgage or auto loan, or can get advice on which stocks, bonds, or other assets they should be investing in. We have a huge list of financial intermediaries, but let's talk about some of the most prominent. First, we have thrift institutions, otherwise known as savings banks or savings and loans. These institutions take deposits and then lend out those funds to individuals seeking loans. Next, we have credit unions. Credit unions are owned by depositors who are all in a common organization. For example, if you're a Ball State student, alumnus, employee, or professor, you can become a depositor of Ball State Credit Union. Credit unions are similar to thrifts and commercial banks in that they receive deposits and lend to individuals. An additional benefit of credit unions is that because they're not-for-profit organizations, they often pay higher interest rates to depositors and charge lower interest rates on the loans that they make. Next, we have commercial banks. Most of the large banks in the U.S. are commercial banks. Commercial banks receive deposits from individuals and lend those funds out to both individuals and firms. One final point I should note about these first three financial intermediaries is that all three of these organizations will also invest in bonds and stocks as well as loaning out money. They do this for a couple of reasons. First, it's more likely the bank will earn a higher return on its investment if it invests in some risky bonds and stocks than if it lends it to individuals. Second, Investing in additional asset classes allows the bank itself to diversify its portfolio, which decreases the likelihood that it will default on its obligations to its depositors, shareholders, or bondholders. Not all financial intermediaries are banks. Mutual funds are often thought of as financial intermediaries because they receive funds from investors in exchange for shares representing a percentage of the mutual fund's assets. The mutual fund then uses that cash to invest in new stocks or bonds, which are added to its portfolio. There are thousands of different mutual funds in the United States. They employ a huge diversity of strategies, too. Some only invest in bonds. Some only invest in stocks. Some invest in a diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds. Others have a goal of dividend accumulation or capital appreciation, 
by purchasing shares of very specific types of equities. Whole life insurance companies are firms that provide long-term contracts called whole life insurance. When you purchase whole life insurance, you begin paying a regular premium, or payment, which is invested in a portfolio of stocks or bonds managed by the insurance firm. You can withdraw these funds if you need them, particularly during retirement. A pension fund is used to fund a retirement plan funded by corporations or a government agency. Both the employer and the employee contribute to the fund, and those funds are invested by the manager of the fund in stocks or bonds. When the employee retires, they can begin withdrawing a certain amount of money from the fund. The most prominent pension fund in the United States is Social Security, or the Social Security Fund. Now let's look outside of the United States. As a result of the rest of the world modernizing, the size of the U.S. markets relative to the world markets has fallen. For example, in 1970, the total market cap, or value of all stocks, on the U.S. stock exchanges represented about 66% of total world market cap. By the end of last year, this had fallen to approximately 40%. This number will likely continue to fall as more countries create stock exchanges and countries like India and Ethiopia see rapid modernization. In addition to U.S. equities shrinking relative to the total world market cap, the U.S. bond market represents a smaller percentage of world bond investment than it did in previous decades. This is due to the fact that in many countries, particularly countries in Africa, countries in Asia, countries in Eastern Europe, both firms and governments are starting to borrow heavily. In some countries, investors are restricted from engaging in certain investments. For example, investors who want to invest in shares of Chinese firms are generally restricted from investing in Class A shares of Chinese firms, which allow the investors voting rights. U.S. investors often can only invest in Class B shares of Chinese firms. There are some exceptions to this, but it does illustrate the fact that investment in some countries is often a bit more restrictive than it is in the United States. Outside of the United States, there are also differences in the quantity and operations of financial intermediaries. Historically, U.S. financial institutions faced a number of strong regulations that prevented these firms from merging, operating across state lines, and maintaining operations outside of financial services. Outside of the United States, that's not the case. In countries such as Japan or India, banks have much more flexibility and can operate in industries outside of the financial sector. Banks in these countries also have greater ability to acquire rivals and benefit from economies of scale. Because of this, there are fewer banks per capita in countries outside of the United States. For example, the country of Japan only had 198 banks as of 2013. While banks in the United States have been rapidly merging, the total number of savings banks, credit unions, and commercial banks in the U.S. as of 2017 was 11,600. I mentioned a few moments ago that historically U.S. financial institutions faced strong regulation, and that prevented these firms from merging, operating across state lines, and maintaining operations outside of financial services. Let's talk about why that is. As a result of the Great Depression, and concerns over banks becoming too big to fail and hurting consumers, Congress passed the Glass-Steagall Act in 1933. This act separated commercial and investment banking services and created the FDIC, or Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. As a result, if your commercial bank or savings bank goes bankrupt, your deposits are insured by the federal government and will be returned to you up to a max of $450,000. The financial industry remained fairly heavily regulated through approximately the late 1980s and early 1990s. However, financial deregulation became much more popular as an idea in the mid-1990s. Congress passed the Interstate Banking and Branching Efficiency Act in 1994, otherwise known as the Regal Neal Act. This allowed banks to operate branches across state lines and acquire banks in other states. Historically, Banks could occasionally operate branches across state lines, but with much greater difficulty. In 1999, the Glass-Steagall Act was repealed by the Financial Services Modernization Act of 1999. This act allowed for rapid consolidation of the banking industry. Many firms that had either been investment banks or commercial banks began to engage in both types of activities. Companies like Goldman Sachs, which had been prevented by the Glass-Steagall Act from operating as a commercial bank, 
started to offer a much wider variety of products and services to their clients. This law increased the profitability of financial intermediaries, but also led to many of the problems that came about a decade later during the financial crisis. As these firms became larger and more interconnected, a failure of any one of these large financial intermediaries meant that other institutions or investors that were connected to these intermediaries might also have to declare bankruptcy. This is where the idea of too big to fail comes from. Many of the largest financial conglomerates like AIG, Bank of America, Citigroup, and Goldman Sachs are large enough that if they were unable to pay their bondholders, this would cause their bondholders to default on their debt obligations and could potentially lead to another financial meltdown. In 2008, after many of the largest financial intermediaries had borrowed heavily and purchased billions of dollars of overvalued mortgage-backed securities, the bottom fell out. The value of many of the assets on the balance sheets of the largest financial intermediaries was far lower than what those banks had paid for those assets. A real estate crisis in 2007 had led to that. As the value of mortgage-backed securities on their balance sheet fell, several financial intermediaries were faced with default. In March of 2008, Bear Stearns, a large financial institution, which is also an investment bank, was bailed out by the U.S. federal government. Then, in September of 2008, Lehman Brothers, another investment bank, was allowed to declare bankruptcy. This event triggered the 2008 financial crisis. Because of falling share prices, high probability of default by banks, and unwillingness of many banks to lend to one another, the U.S. federal government passed the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act in 2008. This provided TARP funds, or Troubled Asset Relief Program funds, that meant that the U.S. federal government acquired a large number of mortgage-backed securities. The goal was to remove these assets from the balance sheets of financial intermediaries and help these intermediaries lend money again. Unfortunately, low liquidity remained in the market for several years. In the immediate aftermath of the financial crisis of 2008, international regulators passed the Basel III Accord, which committed U.S. banks to decreasing the risk of the assets on their balance sheets. In the United States in particular, the Dodd-Frank Act was passed by the Obama administration with the goal of providing greater oversight of financial intermediaries and preventing many of the causes of the financial crisis. The Dodd-Frank Act mandated many changes to the financial industry in the United States. First, it created the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or CFPB. This organization was tasked with protecting consumers from predatory interest rates and monitoring cases where financial intermediaries might have broken the law. Dodd-Frank also created the FSOC, or Financial Stability Oversight Council, which is a collection of the top regulators in the United States. The objective of this council is to meet regularly to discuss emerging threats in the U.S. economy and prevent those threats from causing another crisis like the one in 2008. So let's review what we just talked about. Financial intermediaries help suppliers of capital provide that capital to entities that demand capital. There are many financial intermediaries in the United States, including commercial and savings banks, mutual funds, and pension funds. The financial industry is heavily regulated relative to financial firms outside of the United States. However, regulatory oversight in the U.S. can change, and during the 1990s and 2000s, we saw several pieces of legislation lead to financial deregulation. More recent legislation has been designed to prevent future financial crises like the one in 2008. So with that, I'm going to wrap up, and if you do have any questions, please feel free to email me or call me or stop by my office hours. Thank you very much.